thing to fold a brand new song. He's made a world of wonders. He rolled up his sleeves. He set things right. God made history with salvation. He showed the world what he could do. He remembered to love us. A bonus to his dear family Israel. Tireless love. The whole earth comes to attention. Look, God's work of salvation. Shout your praises to God, everybody. Let loose and sing. Strike up the band. Round up an orchestra to play for God. Add on a hundred voice choir. Featured trumpets and big trombones fill the air with praises to King God. Let's the sea and its fish give a round of applause with everything living on earth joining in. Let ocean breakers call out, encore, and mountains harmonise the finale. Tribute to God when he comes, when he comes to set the earth right. He'll straighten out the whole world. He'll will put the world right and everyone in it. The first reading, as you can see on the screen, is from the Old Testament, book of Genesis, chapter 6, verses 9 to 22, all about Noah preparing for the flood. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you. And you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you and be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. And that's the first reading. Do you want the second one straight away? Okay. The second reading is actually from Romans, in the New Testament. And it's chapter 8, verses 18 to 25. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that God will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay 
and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sonship, sorry, adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. There ends the readings. Okay. So we're still in the Easter season. We're thinking about new life. New life for the whole of creation today, as I've already said. And I think I'm really sharing what I'm about to share because I'm aware that some people are not quite sure how the good news is good news for the whole of creation. And because, well, Christians, particularly evangelical ones, can often write care for creation off as not important. I say that, but I don't want to say that every evangelical Christian does that. I'm just saying that some can. <laughs> because I have heard or experienced the effects of a few of these attitudes in my life. I'm going to give you three examples. Evangelism is what really matters. Saving souls, not seals. Only humans really matter. Care for the poor, not porcupines. And God will destroy the earth, so it doesn't really matter. If you like big words, that one's really about an environmental eschatology. As you might have gathered, I'm not a big fan of these attitudes. They're not great because they seem to somehow miss the point of quite a lot of scripture. So the church needs to understand that we need a bit of a change in our attitude. A change that is quite a big one. Some might call it a paradigm shift. A similar paradigm shift might be as when Copernicus realized that the earth rotates around the sun rather than the sun around the earth. To demonstrate some of the issues with these ways of thinking, and to help us to realize how we treat scripture, I want us to look at two together. The first is the one that we heard when Mabel read just now, the story of Noah. It's often left in Sunday school, a nice story for children to teach them to count in twos about animals, colors of the rainbow, and let's face it, as far as children's stories goes, it's got the, a minor threat of violence, but a happy ending. It is actually, though, an Old Testament paradigm example of the solution Jesus came to bring. As you think about the story of Noah, I want you to ask yourselves, who gets saved? Who gets saved? Very few humans, eight in total, four men and four women. Yet 14 of many species of wildlife are saved because Noah has to save seven pairs of all birds and seven pairs of all clean animals. But on top of those, he also has to save at least one pair of every species. The story of Noah is a story of a God who is passionate about biodiversity conservation. Some more big words for you. A God who cares about the diversity of creatures upon the earth. Look again at the passage. This time ask yourselves, why are the species saved? Because they're not saved for Noah's sake, so that he can enjoy a nice joint of roast beef or a chicken chow mein, nor so that he can have a nice pet to stroke in an evening, but so that their kind may continue on the earth. They matter to God. And the rainbow that is given 
is a sign of God's covenant with the whole of creation. Every living creature. If you look a few chapters ahead in Genesis 9, seven or eight times, depending on which translation you look at, God refers to his covenant with a non-human creation. In one verse, his covenant is with the earth. With that in mind, then, we realize that actually this suddenly nice children's story is quite an explosive passage for our theology of salvation. So now let's turn to the best-known Bible verse in the whole world, John 3, 16. God so loved the people that he gave his only son. Is that how it goes? I'm hoping some of you are sat there going, no, Ben, that's not how it goes. And yet I'm told that in most Chinese translations of the Bible, that's actually what it says. For God so loved the people. Because we have for years as a church equated world with people. Yet the Greek word for world is cosmos. So it actually reads, for God so loved the cosmos that he sent his only begotten son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. Does that sound better? The cosmos, the whole created order, everything is under Jesus. Jesus is Lord of it all. I just use that verse as a demonstration of how we can often miss what's in the Bible by reading it in English. Not that I can read it in Greek or Hebrew. I'm in the same boat as you. I have to rely on cleverer people to tell me what the translations are. Or go and do an awful lot of learning, I guess. We tend to read it as well through the lens of Jesus and me. Or Jesus and us. But not as Jesus, God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And the whole of creation. Another issue that we have as the church with our theology, especially in the West, is we tend to suffer from a rather dualistic worldview. We have this habit of separating out the spiritual and the earthly. And that sort of attitude says, we have Jesus and we want others to join our church because one day we will get taken up to heaven. But in that worldview, heaven is separate and other a.k.a. nothing to do with this reality. And the problem with that is that it writes off the environment. It writes off culture, business, sport, politics, poverty, arts, and medicine, as it's all fairly inconsequential because it's going to be burnt up one day. The only thing that matters, according to that worldview, is saving souls and getting them to heaven. But I don't quite think that's the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is speaking about when he shares what he has to say in his ministry. Instead, I think he speaks about a kingdom gospel of transformation, of renewal and restoration. And the transformation is not just an individual one, though it definitely starts there, I think. We are all individual human beings, who respond to the cross and resurrection of Jesus. But our individual transformations are like dropping a stone into a pool. The ripples keep going outwards, transforming the church. Though that can be a bit hard to believe sometimes and a bit difficult to see because it can take a long time. Transforming the church, transforming the community, addressing issues of justice, poverty, and accountability, and ultimately transforming the whole of creation. The kingdom of God is creation healed. Ultimately, our theology of creation care does not, like some believe, just come from Genesis 1, but the whole Bible. It is a part of the meta-narrative within the big story of God's saving work. I'm not going to have time to go into too much detail now, but the drama is broken into roughly five acts. Creation, fall, Israel, Jesus, and then the new creation. 
Let's start at the beginning. Let's start with the blessed creation. And let's understand together, shall we, that God made it good. If you know your Bibles, then you know each day, as God finished his creating, he said it was good. And at the end, when all was finished, God said, this is very good. Again, some people say to me, oh, God says it's very good once he's made humankind. But actually, he says it's very good when creation is finished. Not because of humankind, but because there is nothing more to be added. It is good. It is finished. It is very good. Psalm 24 tells us that the earth is the Lord's. And then something else as we think about the blessed creation is to think about our part within it. And I think there are two points that I want to make here that go together. That are two sides of one coin that we have to hold in tension together. Humanity is a part of creation, not separate from it. We are a part of it. We are made from dust, according to Genesis 2.7. But humanity is also called a part to image God in caring for creation. We are given a task. More on that in a minute. But these two things need to be held in tension together not one or the other. Because if we believe that we are a part of creation, but not separate, then we are just a part of nature. Why would we intervene? We're the virus species, the cause of the problem. Maybe nature would be better off without us. That view on its own is a dead end. It goes nowhere, there is no hope. But if we believe we're separate from creation and creation is just there for us to do what we like with, then that is a deeply destructive worldview too. And that is what many think the church believes. That we're told that we can subdue creation and we can therefore do whatever we want. And yet I don't think it is what the church believes, is it? No. The Bible says no. We are a part of creation, but called a part within creation to image God. The best demonstration I can think of this is it's a bit like a minister. A minister is a part of the church, but set apart within the church to a specific role, to fulfill a specific function. And so too is humanity's part within creation. We are a part of it, and yet we are set apart with a specific role and function to play. Being a part of creation and having a special role and function to play means that we do, somehow in a special and unique way, bear the image of God. Bearing the image of God is a privilege in that he didn't have to give it to us. But it's not the sort of entitled privilege that we see elsewhere in society sometimes. It is not a case of, oh, I'm allowed to do this, therefore I can do whatever I want. It is much more like a responsibility. Genesis 1.28 tells us that we can subdue and rule over the earth. But that doesn't mean exploit and destroy. The word used for subdue is what a farmer does to an overgrown field. To dig up weeds, to make it fruitful, to cut off diseased plants, and to just generally look after it. In Genesis 2.15, Adam is sent to till and keep the garden. The Hebrew words used actually translate nicely as to serve and preserve. This is what it means to image God to creation, to serve and preserve it, 
Just as God serves and preserves us, so we are called to serve and preserve creation. If we fail to do that, we fail to present the image of God that we are called to. We are called, therefore, to be servant stewards. Are you still with me? Wonderful. I'm going to leave creation there. And we're going to skip over Acts 2, 3 and 4, and I'll come back to those another time. We'll skip to the end, to new creation. And we'll think about a few other things that as a church we need to get a grip of. We need to get rid of our childhood ideas about heaven. There are no beards or fluffy clouds in the scriptural references to the kingdom of God. They are nice images, but they are childhood ideas. We need to be real about God, what God really wants us to do. And likewise, let's be aware of the influences that are upon us from popular fiction, whether that's Christian fiction or other fiction, around heaven and life after death. And let's also be really wary of turn or burn sermons. Jesus didn't threaten people into the kingdom. He may have pointed out their sins and the consequences of them, but he never threatened them. The Bible does talk about hell, but not actually that much. So let's not use those few verses as our basis to share faith with others when actually there is so much more of a wealth and breadth within the Bible that allow us to offer hope and good news. A new life, if you will. As I've already said, let's be careful of sub-Christian ideas on matter and spirit, especially the separation of body and spirit. We were created as whole beings with minds, bodies and spirits, which all relate to one another. And finally, let's be careful about our understanding of difficult scriptural passages. If I asked you, where in the Bible, if we're thinking about new creation, would you turn? Which book of the Bible would you point me towards? Anyone got any ideas? Revelation? Revelation is where I think I would go. Revelation 21 talks about a new heaven and a new earth. Now, as a younger Christian who grew up in this country, I have to say I'm fairly impatient and I, and I still am today, fairly impatient. And I'm a bit like, well, fine, let's get rid of the old and let's have the new now, please, God. Let's have the new heaven, let's have the new earth and let's just get on with it. That sounds great. I want to be there. Anyone sympathize with that? Empathize with that? Yeah? The, the problem is that I've grown up in a fairly disposable culture where I can throw things away and have new with relative ease. And I've also grown up with quite a limited language called English. Because you see, in Greek, there are two words for new, at least two words for new. There might be more. Neos, which means brand new. So I might have a brand new car. I might have a Neos Nissan. That would be good, wouldn't it? Or there's kainos, which means renewed, restored, repaired, recycled. And guess which one of those Greek words is used in Revelation when we're talking about a new heaven and a new earth? Kainos, the one that is talking about renewed and restored. We're not talking about a brand new one. We're not talking about throwing away the old and starting again. We're talking about renewing what God created, restoring Eden, returning to Shalom. We need to be careful with the way that we use the words from Matthew 24, verse 35, 
and I think Psalm 119 as well, where it talks about the world passing away. We need to be careful about the languages of dissolving like snow. From 2 Peter, I think it is. We need to be careful about the language of being burnt by fire. There is going to be fire, but again, it's not a fire that consumes everything. It is the refiner's fire, the farmer's fire for burning away the stubble, for getting rid of the dross and the old and creating space for the new. I think Romans 8, Paul says some good things about what will come at the end. The creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. So just who are these children of God? Because he mentions them a few verses earlier too, where he says the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. The children of God are the redeemed people, the church. So creation is waiting for the church. Creation is waiting for us. So let's not keep creation waiting any longer, shall we? Let's get on board. Let's help creation out. I'm aware that as a church, we have already started that journey. We've got our Browns Eco Badge Certificate Award, whatever we're calling it, out in the foyer. We've appointed David to help us relook at those credentials to see if there's anything more we can do. Let's look again at our lives too. Because God has given us a privilege to reflect his image and a privilege to help him restore his creation. And this calling should go to the core of who we are. It is a part of our discipleship as we live in the light of future truth. As we live in the light knowing that creation is going to be restored and renewed, not thrown away and started again. And we see that don't we? In the body of Jesus, as he's resurrected. It is recognisable. There is something of the old there, but there is also something different within him. Because actually, he seems to be able to walk through walls and appear and disappear at will, to hide his identity from his disciples. But also, he can be seen, he can be recognised. And he can also be touched and eat fish and chips, well, fish at least. There is something of the old, but something new within him. He is the start, the first fruits of God's recreation. That is our future. Let's make sure we live in the light of that. And let's let this message go into our mission as well, for it is good news for all creation. For God and his people are here to serve and preserve God's world, God's cosmos. And let's seek creation's freedom from decay in our mission, for that is God's mission. Let's make it part of our worship as we envision God's peaceful kingdom. Let's not imagine fluffy clouds, but let us imagine a restored world, a renewed creation. What does that look like? Let us pray for God's kingdom on earth, just as Jesus taught us to do. And let's worship by living sustainably. Choosing to change our lifestyles is not succumbing to a fad of today, but an act of worship. An act of devotion to God and his calling upon his church. 
So let's join the worship of all of creation, the, so the birds that sing, the mountains that stand for centuries and see the changing seasons over that scale of time. The rivers as they flood and rabble and babble, the oceans as they rage and roar. Let's join in, shall we? Shall we? Are you sure? You don't seem convinced. Do you want to join in? You're still not very loud. Have you all gone to sleep? Sorry? How do all of these generations fit on this new earth, Mabel? It is a big question, and as I said earlier, I don't have all the answers. God is still a mystery. We're, we, on as ourselves, are never going to bring about the new creation. It is only ever going to be complete when Christ comes again. But then we might know. And we might not know, but it might not matter. Shall we worship God? Shall we care with God as we sing together? So will I.